Okay, um, just a few things um, as we're getting settled here and uh, I see somebody else just jumped on so maybe we'll get a few more people. Um, I'm going to ask you all to keep your microphones muted. Um, you can turn your camera off for stronger internet connection. Pretty much I'm just going to be sharing my screen um, for the presentation. So um, you're not really going to need to see everybody else's video. Um, please feel free to type in the chat box for questions. I will stop several times um, during the program for questions. Um, and so you can type your, your questions in there and then we'll gather those up um, as we stop. And then uh, we are recording tonight, so um, the recording will be available online. Um, we usually get them posted, you know, within a week or so of the presentation. So um, with that, away we go. I'm gonna minimize my video, okay. Um, so we're here, here tonight to talk about vernal pool exploration. Um, and as I said, I am Christy Morley. I am the senior naturalist at Wissahickon Trails. And so welcome to all of you. Um, if you are new to Wissahickon Trails and not familiar with us, um, just a few minutes to uh, set the stage of sort of who we are and what we do. Uh, we are an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We're a little over 60 years old and we were founded to protect the land and water um, largely of the upper Wissahickon Creek. So. Um, Basically, Montgomery County is where we operate, and then we work with our partners in Philadelphia County, where the creek um, travels through that area. Uh, to date, we have protected nearly 1,300 acres of land from development, and on that land, we have 12 nature preserves and 24 miles of trails that are open to the public. So please enjoy. Um, because we are a nonprofit, we do depend on our supporters. And if you're a supporter and on the call tonight, uh, I thank you uh, personally. Uh, we really need our supporters to believe in our mission and um, to help us continue that mission of land preservation and protection. So real quick, an outline for tonight, um, kind of four basic areas that we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to start off with what are vernal pools and what exactly are we talking about when we say vernal pool. And then we're going to talk about the species that use them. Uh, we're going to talk about the differences in indicator species versus what we call facultative species, species essentially that require um, vernal pools for their breeding cycle, and then other species that just kind of use them because they're there, but they can breed in other areas. And then wrap up um, talking about the monitoring project that we're um, kicking off essentially uh, with this presentation um, to help Wissahickon Trails understand the vernal areas that are on the properties around the Wissahickon Creek and um, monitor them for the species that might be there. And we'll talk more about that as we go forward. And so again, just a reminder, in case anybody's jumped on late, um, feel free to type questions in the chat box as I'm going along and I'll stop um, about three times throughout the presentation to um, take those questions. So, okay. So what are vernal pools? Um, vernal pools actually go by a lot of different names depending on who you talk to, the area of country that you live in, um, is it a pool? Is it a pond? Uh, but the reality is, is that um, regardless of their name, they all have several unique characteristics, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Vernal pools really, vernal just means related to spring. And you'll see as we go through, um, a lot of these pools very much come into their own in the springtime. But they actually do go by all of these different kinds of names and they basically all mean the same thing. And you see the idea they're temporary intermittent. They don't stay around all the time. And we'll talk about that um, as we get a little bit deeper into them. But basically, regardless of their name, they all share these very similar characteristics. They're typically small. Um, some like this example here from Maine can look, you know, seem rather large um, by perspective, but compared to what we think of most ponds or lakes being, they're actually very small. And most vernal areas are actually much smaller than this example picture here. They are typically very shallow depressions. You could probably walk across most vernal areas and not the water wouldn't even come up to your knees. Um, they're usually very shallow. They are temporary to semi-permanent. 
Um, they are fishless, which is absolutely critical to a number of the species that breed there. They can, they will only pick areas of water that do not contain fish for their breeding cycles. Um, and that's absolutely in, incredibly important. And so what happens with that is um, because they, these can, pools can actually occur in a range of wetland types, which you'll see um, in the next couple of slides, but the, the, essence of them is is that they are very isolated. So unlike most lakes or even ponds that are fed from some other source, there is a creek, there's a tributary, um, there's some kind of something that flows into that depression that forms the lake. And then there's usually also an outlet, some small body of water that leaves that lake. And so you get some water turnover. Um, for vernal pools, they're isolated. There's no inlet and there's no outlet for most of them and the vast majority of them, which means there's no fish uh, because there's really no way for fish to get in there. And because they're so shallow and because they dry out, fish won't survive um, that kind of drying out period. So that's really important um, for them. And then most vernal pools um, support these breeding indicator species, and we'll talk uh, more about what that means uh, in a little bit. But you can see here from this example, this is the same pool, wet on the top and dry on the bottom. And so you can see it's actually pretty shallow. There's no real deep spots there. I mean, if you look at where the, the um, trunk sticks out here into the water, it's barely touching the water. And that's that's pretty much the bottom right there. Um, so they are are very shallow in most cases. So as I said, they can occur in a variety of wetland types. And oftentimes they are simply unvegetated puddles that exist, some low lying spot that collects water in some way. And there it is. Um, and in fact, a lot of the ones that we have along the Wishicken Creek actually look very much like this. Um, but vernal pools can also contain more vegetation, like these sort of mixed shrub, marshy kind of areas. Um, they may be sort of more grass, like the one on the lower left, more shrubby, more open, um, like the one on the top. And they may look very different depending on the season. So they may look like the one on the top right during the wet season or wetter season. And then as the water dries out, they look more like the one on the bottom where the grass starts to grow a little bit more, um, you know, as it gets exposed to uh, non um, water holding periods. But they can also um, be largely shrubs. So if you look just down here at the very bottom, um, there's just sort of this wet, muddy area. And underneath all of these shrubs during the very wettest parts of the year, there will be standing water down there. And that's another way um, that a vernal pool can exist. And then the last is actually what we call sort of a swamp, a forest pool with trees actually growing, you know, right in the pool. And they all function in pretty much the same way. Um, the fact that they're vegetated versus not vegetated may impact some of the species that use them, but not necessarily. Um, usually there's enough fallen branches and other things like that, even in the unvegetated pools, that the species that we'll talk about will still use them. Um, so don't think that the unveg unvegetated pools are uh, devoid of life because um, they actually are not. They can be very active. Vernal pools, as I've indicated, have a wet period and a dry period. And we call that wet period, um, the amount of time that the, the vernal pool is full of water, the hydro period. And I've got an example chart here and it's very busy, but basically what it's saying is there's a lot of different kinds of vernal pools. And they all sort of function the same way. Um, there's often, you know, a wet period and a dry period. So the dark lines here are when the pool is full of water. Um, but some, if you've ever visited Four Mills, we have a vernal area there um, and this is it. And it is essentially down here at the bottom. It is a semi-permanent to permanent pond, if you will. Um, it's almost always got water in it and it can take multiple years of drought to completely empty this pool. 
Um, but it will become much more shallower during hotter periods, and especially if we have periods that don't have a lot of rain, um, it will get much lower, but it almost always has some water in it. But others can literally be puddles that fill and dry multiple times in a year, depending on the weather and rainfall. Um, and so uh, the other thing that we see here is that some, some vernal pools are um, what we call spring filling. So they're more likely to collect water during that spring period um, into the early summer and others are fall filling um, and collecting water more during the rainy period in the fall. And, uh, you know, then drying out again during the, the hottest days of the summer. And it can impact some of the species that use um, whether pool fills in the spring or the fall. But for the most part, um, they're operating, you know, very similarly, um, a period of wet and a period of dry. So how do they fill? Well, we've kind of already mentioned this a little bit, but basically rain and snow are the, the two most likely ways to fill a vernal pool. Um, when we think of sort of true vernal or spring filling pools, oftentimes they're filled with snowfall. So during the winter, that depression collects snow. And then as it gets warm in the late winter and early spring, or we have a couple of warm spells, um, that snow starts to melt and fills the pool. Uh, in addition, surface water runoff anytime it rains or from melting snow from other areas can also accumulate in those low lying areas. And it's important to know where the water's kind of coming from in the pool. Is it coming from runoff or is it a more self-contained area? Because if it's coming from runoff, depending on where that water is coming from, could be bringing significant amounts of pollutants into that pool. And that's not going to be good for any of the creatures that want to try to use it. Um, because those, because there's really no outlet for that water, those things are just going to accumulate uh, in that pool and in the, the detr detritus at the bottom of the pool. And uh, eventually that, that pool may actually become dead um, and just basically be a puddle. So um, that's one of the things that we're also trying to understand and we'll, we'll see in the monitoring project, um, sort of how the pools that we have um, along the Wissahickon are filling. So another way that pools fill is actually by um, overbank flooding. So um, this kind of usually supercharges the pool because obviously if they are a low lying depression, they are collecting rain and snow as it happens. But like the, the vernal area of Four Mills, when we have heavy rains and heavy floods and the creek floods, um, it kind of really supercharges that pool and that vernal area um, at Four Mills. And so that's what can happen for some of these other areas as well. It takes that, that immense amount of water from flooding to really fill them up um, to stay wet for a longer period of time. And some pools are actually connected to groundwater. So in times of plenty and when the water table is high, that pool will be basically filled from the bottom, if you will. Um, but in areas, times of drought or lower water, the water table goes down, those pools may not fill at all. Um, and they may not really hold water unless they have that groundwater source um, feeding them regularly. When we talk about vernal pools, it's not just the water itself that's important. There's actually kind of three life zones um, around these seasonal pools. So one is the actual pool depression itself where the water is. Um, there's an area about roughly 100 feet around that pool. Think of that as sort of the pool envelope. Um, and this becomes important habitat for um, some certain species, but it also sort of impacts the water quality of the pool. As I said, where the runoff is coming from, um, what it's getting filtered through before it gets to that pool. And then you think of also the terrestrial habitat around the pool. Um, and, you know, they say a thousand feet here. Some species may need a little bit more than that, but this terrestrial habitat is really important because as you'll see, apart from a very short period of breeding and egg deposition in those pools, 
the vast majority of the time, these species are actually spending their life cycles in this terrestrial habitat. So this is a really important component of those pools. You need all of those things. You need the pool and the water and you need that terrestrial habitat. And so one of the examples, and we'll see um, some of these species in more detail in a minute, but you know, if you have a vernal pool here, we have wood frogs and wood frogs are one of the indicator species. And after they leave the vernal pool, they use an area of forested wetland for sort of their non-winter parts of their life cycle. And they need sort of that wet area um, in the woods to, you know, live out their life and find their food and all of those kinds of things. But once winter starts to come, they actually move away from that forested wetland and, and the wet area and actually move to a drier forested upland area. And they stay in that upland area until it's time to go back to the vernal pool uh, in the very late winter, early spring. And so that components of all of those elements of that terrestrial habitat and the vernal pool area itself are really important um, for that species. On the other hand, the marbled salamander, which you'll meet in more detail uh, as well, really spends most of its time just in the forested upland area and upland habitat um, doesn't really need the wetland. So you do need that variety um, of, of habitats around the vernal pool to support those species. So I'm gonna see if we have any questions yet. And I don't see any here. So again, um, feel free to type your questions in the chat box and I'll stop again um, in a few minutes and see if there's any questions. So. so as I said, there's indicator species and these species require fishless vernal pools to complete their life cycle. Uh, they don't live any other place basically and they need that terrestrial habitat around those vernal pools, um, in the case of three of them, to complete their life cycles. These are the four that we have in our area, the fairy shrimp, the wood frog, the spotted salamander, and the marbled salamander. I don't want you to go away thinking these are the only four indicator species because they're not. In other areas of the country, there may be um, different species of salamander in addition to these. There may be completely different um, species of salamanders, not either of these two and or frogs as well. So um, fairy shrimp are pretty much common across all areas that have vernal pools. Um, there's different species of fairy shrimp, but they all basically function the same way. So these are the ones that we have in our area that would indicate that we have what we would think of as a true vernal pool. Um, a little bit about the timing of things. I indicated stuff happens, you know, early, late winter, early spring. And basically, if you look at, so these are the four indicator species that we have in our area. And fairy shrimp can pretty much be laying, be have eggs in a vernal area all year round. And they're kind of the exception to the rule. And we'll talk about them um, in their detail slide in a second, but pretty much they can lay eggs at any time throughout the year. Spotted salamanders um, and wood frogs down here at the bottom are pretty early breeders. So they can start laying eggs uh, in January, in the case of the wood frog, um, through to the end of April and spotted salamanders start in February and you know through to the end of April. And so then the rest of their life cycle is uh, you know, based on whenever the eggs are laid. Marbled salamanders, on the other hand, actually do their breeding cycle in the fall. And so their eggs are probably in vernal areas now or getting ready to go into vernal areas now. Um, and then they'll complete their life cycle um, in a couple of different ways, actually depending on when the pool gets wet. And we'll see that um, in a couple of slides. So basically for the most part, you know, things happen pretty early in the, in the year and things can happen when there's snow on the ground, when there's still ice, a little bit of ice on the pool and life gets going. Um, so it's really kind of remarkable how um, early these things happen sort of when we, when we would think spring's not really here yet, um, the vernal pool is well on its way. And part of the advantage to that is because these species breed so early, they minimize predators. A lot of the other species are still hibernating, are still not active because it's cold. And so these 
species have adapted and they make it work and it limits um, the amount of predators that are in that pool, um, particularly during the most vulnerable stage of their egg development. And so when we think about life cycle, we're going to use the spotted salamander as an example, but the marble salamander and the wood frog are all very similar to this. Eggs are laid in the vernal pool, usually in clusters, kind of a jelly-like substance around them. They go through several stages of development as a larva in the pool. Um, during those stages, they get bigger, and then they can also look different. So the, the larva here on the top is a um, younger larva, larval stage, and the one on the bottom is an older larval stage. You see it starts starting to get these yellow spots down the side. Um, when it's finished and when it's ready to take that next step, it's, that's usually time and temperature dependent. Um, it undergoes its final metamorphosis and becomes this fully uh, terrestrial adult and leaves the vernal pool. Um, and pretty much, like I said, the, vernal, the, the wood frog and the uh, marble salamanders, same thing. Fairy shrimp are the ones that are a little bit different um, because they can pretty much be in the pool all the time. So this picture on the left here, you can see all those sort of fluorescent little tails, if you will. Those are all fairy shrimp. Um, the two close up pictures here, this one, the more green one is a male and this one on the top is a female. These guys are only found in temporary pools where fish are absent. That's the only place that they will live ever. Um, they're only about an inch long. They're actually related to lobsters and crabs. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> like the tiny little freshwater things that, you know, links to lobsters in the ocean. Um, they're filter feeders. So they, they, um, they actually do swim upside down. <laughs> and the, the legs here, they have 11 sets of legs that they use to swim and propel themselves through the water. And um, this is actually where their oxygen transfer takes place as well. So that's how they get oxygen in and out of their cells. They are um, an important food source for tadpoles and larval salamanders in a vernal pool. Um, but they also help with the overall life cycle of the vernal pool because they eat um, bacteria and detritus and zooplankton and all those other things that are in the water and components of that breakdown of all those leaves and branches and pine needles that fall in, into the vernal pool. Um, and so they help sort of that overall cycling of nutrients through the pool. So they're really important. Um, generally, they hatch in late winter and early spring. Um, and they're ones that can sometimes be seen swimming under the ice surface. The females, which is this one up here on the top, um, the color difference here is actually a little bit because they're different species. The males aren't all green and the females aren't all sort of this orangey color. We do have two different species here, but they function exactly the same way. Um, and there's different species, you know, in California and in Maine and, and so on. Um, but they pretty much all look the same. I don't know how they can tell they're different species, honestly. And they, you know, they function the same way in a vernal pool. The females actually kind of have this little pouch here where they carry their eggs. Um, their eggs are actually known as cysts. And um, when the development of those eggs is ready, they'll release them um, to the bottom of the pool. And they basically can release two types of eggs. So the spring sort of summer eggs, um, they'll hatch really quickly and the young will develop in that same season. So if, for example, these are released in March um, or April, you know, those young will develop rapidly and become adults, excuse me, and carry on the next cycle. Um, they can also lay winter eggs. And this typically happens late in the fall um, or early winter and at, during a period, a hydro period with water in the pool, um, the eggs will, cysts will actually fall to the bottom and they can survive drying. Uh, they can survive drying for several months actually. And they actually require a dry period in order to hatch. There's something about their physiology and the time of year that they're laid. It's like they know. So they need that dry period. And then when that pool fills back up, they'll hatch. 
um, as the, you know, and usually that happens the following spring and when the pool refills in the spring and the dissolved oxygen levels are at their peak. So that may be another indicator um, to those cysts that, you know, oxygen levels reach a certain point. Okay, it's safe for us to come out and continue on with our lives. Um, the actual life cycle of these guys is really fast. So from the eggs hatching, to all the molts that they go through in their instars to actually becoming fully functional, reproducing adults and laying the next set of eggs can occur in 16 days. Um, so it can be really, really fast turnover of fairy shrimp, shrimp in a vernal pool. The next species is wood frogs. Um, these guys are small. The adults are only um, about two inches long from the tip of their nose, you know, their body length, um, not counting their legs. They're pretty small. Um, they actually have the widest distribution of all North American frogs. And take note of where this distribution is, because this is this is really cool about these frogs, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Um, the most obvious field mark that these guys have is sort of this black mask behind their eyes, it can actually vary in color and varying shades of brown. Um, sometimes these side stripes are a little bit more obvious than in others. This guy actually looks like it's got a little tinge of green on it. And so they have some variability, but it's this the size and the black mask that are really their key um, uh, field marks. So these guys are explosive breeders. Um, they that means that pretty much all the frogs in an area breed together in a very short period of time. The adult frogs migrate back to the pool that they were born in, sometimes when there's still snow on the ground, actually, um, and they usually tend to time their arrival. So they get there as soon as the ice starts to melt, and they do that by migrating at night, usually when it's raining. So think late March, if you will, after some a little bit of warm spells and things start to melt a little bit, and then we have some cooler rainy nights, that's the kind of weather that's going to get um, the fro wood frogs going. It's the same kind of weather that's going to get spotted salamanders going as well. But the wood frogs are usually a little bit earlier than the spotted salamanders. Males usually arrive to the vernal pool first, and they're in evidence by their quack-like vocalizations. And hopefully our technology is all working right, so you will actually be able to hear this. So this is what the wood frog sounds like. So you could also hear spring peepers in the background, and that's another really good indication that wood frogs might be active. Usually when the spring peepers start is when the wood frogs are out and about. Um, they typically only spend a really short period of time, sometimes only days at the vernal pool. And in most cases, no longer than about two weeks. The eggs are contained in sort of these giant jelly-like masses. Um, each female deposits between a few hundred to a few thousand eggs. And interestingly, the eggs are laid in communal clusters. So this is actually the egg mass from several different females. And they lay them all together, probably a little bit of safety in numbers, <laughs> kind of an idea. Um, if they're all together, there's a chance that at least some of them will survive. Hatching usually occurs within about three weeks of when the eggs are um, deposited, but it is temperature de dependent. So if it gets really cold again, it might take a little longer. Um, and then the tadpoles will stay in the vernal pool until um, the final metamorphosis into an adult, which happens by early summer. And then they leave the pool and they're gone. Um, so remember what I said, the range of these frogs is really unique. And Actually, I'm going to go back to the slide with that for a second. So if we look at this, wood frogs actually have a range that takes them all the way from Alaska into the very, very 
coldest parts of Canada and you know what we think of as the cold parts of the northeast into New England and then up in Michigan and Minnesota and Wisconsin I mean cold winter areas so how do they survive the winter um, in these areas well they freeze and I mean literally they freeze um, most frogs in our area, like green frogs or bullfrogs, um, survive winters by hibernating deep underwater, so buried in mud of ponds and lakes and streams. And they're cold and they're dormant, but their body temperature never falls below freezing. Wood frogs, on the other hand, have a very different strategy. Um, they will move away from those wetland areas, as I said earlier, into sort of a more forested upland area bury themselves in the leaf litter, but that, and that leaf litter and eventual snow can give them some level of insulation, but they're really not protected from freezing temperatures. And normally when we think of freezing living tissue, it's a bad thing. Um, ice crystals can puncture blood vessels, oxygen transfer to cells and, and critical organs like your brain or your heart is impaired, but not in the wood frog. Um, when the wood frog feels the first ice crystals around it, it kicks into hibernation mode. So sort of the first frost, um, when it feels those ice crystals on the plants and the vegetation that it might be in, its body kicks into hibernation mode and it actually freezes. Um, the liver produces large amounts of glucose that sort of makes this slurry sort of an antifreeze, if you will, throughout the whole body, um, prevents dehydration, but it actually does freeze. And uh, the reason why the eye, eyes look white here is actually because they're frozen. Um, it's kind of amazing. If you touch this frog, there's no heartbeat. There's no muscle movement. It is a frozen lump of frog and it spends the winter this way. Um, it is completely in a state of suspended animation. And in the spring, as it starts to warm up, it actually begins to thaw from the inside out. First, the heart starts beating, then its brain activates, and then the legs move, and then it makes its way back to its vernal pool. And it's really, really quite phenomenal uh, that this tiny little frog can survive winters in Alaska by freezing itself and waiting for the spring. Um, and honestly, this is a, an area where researchers are using this frog as an example of how do we, um, you know, use freezing to help humans uh, recover from injury, you know, survive freezing, all of those kinds of things, uh, because it's actually quite amazing. Um, and they don't really actually even understand what, like, how its heart starts beating again. So that's sort of a very active area of research um, to understand that because that could have um, significant implications um, for human well-being in certain circumstances um, to be able to get a beating heart to start again that has stopped. So really quite a, a fascinating little creature. Next up is the spotted salamander. Um, these guys are actually pretty large. They're six to eight inches long. Um, they, they're sort of the slate gray. They have uh, these orange spots down the side and they're all a little bit different. So individual animals can actually be identified by spot pattern. And that's part of the reason why um, a lot of the research that we have on salamanders and vernal pools comes from spotted salamanders. Uh, we'll talk about marbled salamanders, but there's not actually as much information out there about them because the spotted salamanders just seem to have been studied so much more. These guys can actually live up to 18 years. Um, they're really long lived in the, and that's in the wild, not in captivity. Um, in captivity, they could probably live even longer. But like the wood frog, um, the males arrive first to the vernal pool. Like the wood frogs, these guys return to the pools in which they were born. So that's, that's one of the reasons why um, land protection and land preservation is really important. And for us to understand where these species might be on any of our preserves um, or in the areas around um, the Wissahickon Trails properties, because um, 
should they be using it, we need to make sure that we protect that particular pond or pool because if it's destroyed through development or whatever, uh, they won't find another pool. They typically won't go substitute another pool. Their you know, imperative is to return to the pool in which they were born. So for the most part, um, that's another one of the really important reasons why we do um, some trying to do some of the monitoring and then also um, as an organization why land protection and preservation is uh, really important. So these guys will actually come, you know, usually when rainfall happens after the temperatures have reached about 50 degrees is when they'll start moving. Um, they can, they like said, still be out when there's snow on the ground and they will cross roads to get to their breeding pool. So if a road has been built somewhere along the way in between um, their, you know, coming out of the vernal pool uh, and then the time it takes to, for them to get back to their vernal pools, they will cross roads. This is actually a, um, an important uh, cause of mortality every year. Um, for these guys and in areas where people know that they're spotted salamanders breeding and areas where they typically do crossroads to vernal pools. This is, if you've ever heard of toad watches, um, you'll often see roads will be closed for the spotted salamanders and spotters will be out there trying to find the salamanders, move them across the road safely, slow down cars, you know, just all of those kinds of things to try to protect them um, to get back to their pools. So, um, Typically what happens is the males arrive at the pool first. Um, the females, like I said, the males, so the temperature is about 50 degrees. The females um, are typically a little bit later. They like it to be a little bit warmer. So it takes about 53 degrees to make them start moving. Um, interestingly enough, researchers have found that not all adults breed every year. So there was a Michigan study that was done and only 36% of the males and 32% of the females in their population um, bred in any given year. But some individuals that were being studied actually skipped three years during a five-year study. So again, being able to identify the salamanders by their spot patterns uh, is an important way of studying and understanding the population in an area. And so researchers can, you know, understand this. So not every salamander is going to come back every year to breed. Only about a third of them do. When the males arrive at the pool and to, to, um, to actually see the breeding part of this is like, it only happens at night. Um, the salamanders very rarely will breed during the day. It's a nighttime thing. They're very nocturnal. Even their migration typically happens at night which is also part of the reason why road co crossings are such um, a cause of casualties in these salamanders because you can't see them in the dark when you're driving a car. Um, so once the salamanders all get into the pool, it's kind of literally this free for all frenzied ball of salamanders. Um, I was trying to find a video of it. I could not find a good video that I could actually embed in my presentation. So you can go on YouTube or search the web for um, salamander, mar spotted salamander um, breeding, and you can actually sort of see this in action. Um, but basically this picture here sort of gives you an idea. It is this sort of writhing ball of salamanders um, and males and females will be in here. And basically all of these white spots here um, that you can see, the males actually release um, spermatophores. So little packets of sperm that the females take and use to fertilize their eggs. And this just happens. And so it's interesting. And this is one of the ways that people can monitor pools because the salamanders aren't often visible during the day, they go hide. So like this picture, you can find them under a log or a rock um, near the edge of the pool during the breeding season, but they often won't be in the water, but the sp spermatophores may still be there. So these can be evidence of breeding um, and that spotted salamanders were there. So it's actually kind of another way to know um, that they're there because they, they are really hard to see. And 
like the frogs, they're not in the pool for a very long period of time. So it may be really easy to miss them, especially the adults. Um, the eggs are laid in masses that are covered in this, you know, thick jelly substance. And if you remember from the life cycle slide, the eggs looked white. And when they're first initially deposited in the pool, they do look white. Uh, but there's actually a particular species of green algae that grows on the jelly of the egg masses. And the algae actually provides the eggs with extra oxygen during their development. And it also may help camouflage the eggs as well. These gray or green um, masses don't look nearly as um, obvious in the water as the white masses do when they're first originally laid. So this may offer some other level of protection. They usually are attached to some kind of vegetation in the pool, either stems of shrubs, um, small roots of trees that might be in the pool or even just fallen branches like here. That's, you know, how they lay their eggs. Excuse me. So um, development at this point. So from the time the lay eggs are laid to the time that the adult salamanders will leave the pool for that generation is about um, six to seven weeks. So usually all of the newly hatched salamanders are gone by um, the end of June in our area. And in some pools that don't dry out completely, some larvae may actually overwinter and not become adults until the following spring or summer. Um, it actually takes these guys a while to become fully mature adults um, and to start that breeding cycle again. So for males, it takes two to three years for them to become fully developed, to become reproductively active. And the females can take three to five years. So they'll spend those two to five years, depending on male or female, um, in that upland forested area and living their life in their little home range that they have in that forested area. And, you know, after three or five years, they may come back to that pool and breed again and then go back um, to the woods uh, as the next generation develops in the pool. And the last indicator species that we have is the marbled salamander. And these guys are about um, three and a half to four inches long. So about half the size of the spotted salamander. They're a very thick bodied salamander and, and a relatively short tail compared to their body length um, compared to some of the other salamander species. These guys, you can actually tell the males from the females. So the male here is on the bottom. It actually has a whiter markings on its back. Um, the females is sort of a duller, not quite so bright white. Um, and you can actually see that difference in the field. These guys are actually fairly long lived as well, can live nine to 10 years, which is pretty remarkable when you think about this tiny little, you know, three and a half inch salamander that spends its time meandering around in the forest, essentially. Um, and these guys do spend most of their life underground and can actually spend their life up to three feet below ground, which is why most of us have probably never seen one. I know I haven't. Um, they live in leaf litter, they live in logs within natural crevices and mammal burrows and, you know, sort of find their way underground. Scientists honestly do not know whether they dig their own burrows or not. There's no really good evidence that says yes, they do or no, they don't. Um, they probably dig some, but they probably rely on mammal burrows and things like that to sort of give them a head start. Um, like the uh, wood frogs and the spotted salamanders, migration takes place on rainy nights, but for these guys that takes place in September to November. And again, um, they are returning to their natal pool, just like the other species were. So wherever they were born, that's where they go back. These guys are unique in that courtship actually takes place in a dry pool. And the females will excavate a nest along the edge of the pool under logs and leaf litter, um, deposit their eggs, and they will actually stay and guard those eggs until the pool fills again. And the eggs can resist drying for a couple of months. Um, generally, these are laid in pools that fill in the fall, but 
in some locations, these eggs can actually survive all winter and the larva will only hatch after they've been submerged for a few days. So it kind of just depends. Um, they, can, they can hatch out in the fall, but a lot of times they just hang out and hatch in the spring. If they hatch in the fall, their development is really, really, really slow over the winter. Obviously, there's not a lot of activity in that pool. It may be frozen in times. So they're buried down in the bottom of the leaf litter and their, their growth is rather slow. Um, once spring hits and it gets warm, then they kind of have this explosive growth period. Um, marbled salamander larvae can often be told from the other larvae in a vernal pool, like um, if there's spotted salamanders in there as well, because they're the bigger ones in the spring, because they've hatched earlier. Um, yeah, so again, same thing. Vernal, the, the larvae live um, on the bottom and sometimes they survive in the winter in this form. Um, sometimes they're as an egg and, you know, early, early spring um, hatching out. And again, these guys can then be predators on the eggs that the frogs lay and the spotted salamanders lay as well. So um, again, an important source of nutrient cycling um, within a vernal pool. And marble salamanders and spotted salamanders and wood frogs can, in theory, all be in the same pool. Um, oftentimes, Marbled are kind of more in one and spotted are in another. Um, wood frogs kind of go back and forth between the two and can be sort of anywhere. Um, but, you know, the, you can have all three of these species and then the fairy shrimps can be in any of the pools. So, um, you know, you see that uh, spreading out of the species. Facultative species, we're not going to go through all of these in detail. Um, these guys, can use vernal pools when they're available. So things like spotted turtles and Easter newts and American toads and green frogs and spring peepers and caddis flies, they can all use um, vernal pools, but they can also breed in other areas. They can breed in ponds. They can breed in areas that have fish. They'll breed in the creek. Um, they don't um, particularly rely on the vernal pool to um, complete their breeding cycle, but they will use it. And again, they pretty much all, with well, the exception of the turtle and the caddis fly, they're a little bit different, but these guys all have uh, life cycles that are fairly similar to the ones that we've talked about. Eggs are laid in the water, they go through transformations to larval stages and then to the fully terrestrial adult forms. So um, the caddis flies are actually a mac macro invertebrate. Um, so living as a larval, they make these um, fantastical kind of cases for themselves to protect themselves as a larva. Um, they can look all different manner of things. This one uses little rocks um, to do that. And once they hatch out and transform, they're actually flies that we see um, flying around uh, in the air. So very different um, kind of a life cycle. And then the turtles as well. And other creatures will visit um, vernal pools. So box turtles and um, any of the mammals of the forest that are looking for meals <laughs> may also visit the pools as well. So in pools, it's a race against time because um, at some point, most pools are gonna enter a dry period. And as we've seen, some things like the fairy shrimp cysts can survive the dry period of a pond, but not everything can. Um, these are spotted salamander eggs and sometimes they can survive a short period because of the sort of jelly protection around them and that can keep them um, from drying out too fast but if this pool doesn't refill quickly those eggs will be lost and this is what happened to the tadpoles here these are wood frog tadpoles in this example that you know the pond dried out before their development was complete um, and they didn't survive and so that's where it is a race against time for um, these species to lay their eggs and hope that that development can be completed uh, before the pond um, reaches its dry period. And so this is also important when we think about things that are impacting um, nature, like climate change related things where we're having um, earlier, hotter dry spells and our precipitation patterns are changing a little bit. We have less snow in this area sometimes than 
we did 25 years ago. We have more rain, which may impact the pools in different ways. We have, you know, um, seasons coming a little bit earlier and all of those things are going to impact um, how species can use these pools and survive. And it is a game of eat or be eaten. Um, vernal pools do play a very important e ecological role in the forest. I mean, obviously we've said they're a requirement for certain species to complete their life cycles, but they are also an important link in the food web. So using the spotted salamander as an example, it, it's eaten by all manner of things. Um, you know, either it's eggs, it's larval form, or it's adult form, anything from newts and wood frog tadpoles and crayfish, all the way up to, you know, skunks and raccoons and turtles. I mean, you know, it's, it's not an easy life to be a tiny little salamander on the forest floor. But at the same time, these guys, just like all salamanders, are important, voracious predators in their own right. So they're eating aquatic insect larvae and fairy shrimp and frog tadpoles and other salamander larvae. And then in their adult terrestrial form, they are an important um, uh, predator species that helps keep the forest floor invertebrate population in check. So they're eating snails and earthworms and slugs and all of those kinds of things and smaller salamanders as well. Um, so again, an important part of the um, food web of the forest. So we talked a little bit, I mentioned migration um, earlier and the fact that these folks, the, the, the species migrate um, away from the vernal pool, leave the vernal pool area, but then come back for their breeding cycles. And so when we talk about migration in these species, how far are we actually talking? Well, it's not actually that far. So if you have a vernal pool and these species, the spotted salamander, the marbled salamander, to me and the wood frog are dispersing. The marbled salamanders actually go the least amount of distance away from the pools, only on average about 636 feet away from the pool in which they were hatched in. Um, spotted salamanders go a little bit further, about 817 feet. And again, there's a range in this, but typically that's about the average. And then the wood frogs actually go the farthest. They go about 3,018 feet. So let's put this in perspective. So um, spotted salamanders, for example, this middle one here, there, um, that's about 272 yards. So three football fields roughly away from the um, vernal pool that they were hatched in. Wood frogs, on the other hand, it's a little over a half a mile. Actually, that's what 3,018 feet is. Um, while they're away from the vernal pool, each species has an area basically that it will spend its time. It sort of develops this home range. And none of these species are particularly territorial in that home range, although they do tend to be sort of the only one there. Um, but the home ranges of, of individual spotted salamanders and wood frogs probably overlap a little bit. But in general, um, spotted salamander home ranges are only about 8 to 15 square meters and wood frog home ranges are about 64 and a half square meters. Now, if you're like me, those numbers mean absolutely nothing to you. So, in some more helpful terms, or hopefully helpful terms, the average U.S. hotel room is about 330 square feet. So spotted salamanders spend most of their time in an area half the size of a hotel room. And the wood frog needs about two hotel rooms to spend its time in the forest. Um, I'm going to stop here for questions and I did see a few pop up. So, but um, this is an interesting picture because this is the size difference between the marbled salamanders and the spotted salamanders so that you can see actually how big the spotted salamanders actually really are. Uh, because I know some of those other pictures lose a little bit of perspective. So let me see what questions we have here. Um, so somebody asked if for wood frogs, is it essential to their life cycle that they do freeze during the winter? Um, if they don't freeze, do they survive? You know, I'm not sure. I think, I, 
I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I think in most cases, because of where they live, we always have freezing temperatures. So they're going to go into that cycle. It would be even for years that we don't have a lot of snow here, for example, we have freeze cycles. So it, I would imagine that most of them do um, actually go through that freezing cycle. But I don't know, that's an actually a good question if they, if they won't survive um, through the winter. I have a feeling that most of them would probably just say stay sheltered in um, uh, you know, the leaf litter and that kind of stuff. And as long as they can find food, they probably would be okay. Um, but if they can't find food, then that's usually the limiting factor for species surviving the winter. Um, somebody m m notes that Quakertown closes the roads for the spotted salamanders. Yep, that's that's what happens in a lot of areas. Um, oh, a comment about the pool at Dodsworth. So we have, a, for those who aren't familiar, one of our properties is at Dodsworth um, Preserve over in North Wales. And the first couple of years that we had the property, it, it had a vernal area. It was not actually a forested vernal area. It's kind of out in the middle of everything, very open. And it attracted geese and shorebirds and it doesn't hold water anymore. And honestly, we don't know why. Um, it could be lack of snowfall. It could be it's just not enough of a push um, to you know really fill that pool. Um, I we we are it's something that we are trying to understand and have an answer to because um, that sort of vernal spring pool area. Uh, is actually really important, especially that one, because it's out in the open for migrating shorebirds and things like that. And so to not have it functioning uh, like it was when we first got the property um, is frustrating and odd. So it is something that we're trying to understand a little bit more and see if we can figure out um, how it can hold water um, and why it doesn't anymore. So the last section that I want to talk about tonight is um, the monitoring project. And it's kind of a, a three-parted project, if you will, with the goal being down here at the bottom, um, to register vernal pools with the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. This is a partnership between um, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, the Fish and Boat Commission, and the Western Pencil Conservation. Pennsylvania Conservancy. And the idea is to um, confirm the location of vernal pools across Pennsylvania, um, partially so that they can be protected, so that we they can be used for research if there's researchers who are interested in understanding vernal pools in a particular area or the species that are using them, and that we have a good understanding of what's out there from a natural resource perspective in our state. And you can see, uh, you know, there's a few registered in Montgomery County or unconfirmed in Montgomery County, I should say. The stars are what are confirmed pools. And so our goal would be sort of threefold. The idea is to map the vernal areas within the Wissahickon watershed. So the northern part of the, um, in Montgomery County where Wissahickon Trails is operating. Uh, we want to spend some time sort of describing those vernal pools, so basic information on the habitat surrounding them. So like the example of the vernal pool at Dodsworth is a very different habitat structure than the vernal area at Four Mills, for example. So understanding the habitats and sort of describing that around them, trying to understand their hydro periods. So when do they fill? When do they dry out? Do they dry out every year? those kinds of things. And then monitoring for indica indicator species or other species that are using them. Ideally, we would love to find wood frogs, spotted salamanders, marbled salamanders, and fairy shrimp. Um, I know that there are spotted salamanders in the lower Wissahickon. And so, um, and there are some programs that transfer wood frog eggs to areas that are suitable for them. So the idea of being able to um, reintroduce some of those species would be, you know, great. Um, 
maybe, fingers crossed, <laughs> if we can um, establish that we have some vernal areas that might be um, particularly uh, suited towards those species. But in order to do that, we have to map them and understand them and see what other species might be using them um, in the meantime. And so for registering um, the pools, we have to be able to find um, one indicator species using them. So one of the four that we talked about or document the life cycles of two to three of the facultative species. And the, it depends on the species that we pick um, or the species that are using the pool, whether we need two or three species to say it's a vernal area. And so the requirements are kind of strict um, for how to register, but the hope is that we have enough information um, from the monitoring aspects of this project that we can do that. So the idea is to put boots on the ground and to get volunteers that might be interested out there looking for vernal areas and sort of owning the ones that they find to help monitor them. Now, I will say there's lots of opportunities. So if you're not really, you know, wanting to go off trail and find your own vernal areas, I do have some vernal areas that I can help you, you know, find and monitor. Um, but my goal really is to try to get some people who are willing to go out and about and off trail and sort of find these spaces. And so right now, a lot of these spaces are going to be dry. And so you're going to be looking for different things than you might be looking for when it's a, a wet, you know, um, season like in March, they're going to look very different. And so right now you would potentially be sort of looking for areas. Um, this top left picture shows um, a swampy area with trees growing in it. And you can see the high watermark on these trees. Uh, and you can see that on a number of trees in the area. And this sort of looks like this depression, this sort of leaf pack type of a thing, not much else is growing there. That's a really good indication that there's probably a vernal pool there. Likewise, this picture on the right, same thing. There's not really things growing here, but you sort of see this packed down look. You can see the depression in the, the, um, the earth itself, where the water's collecting. So here, the deepest part might still have a little bit of water in it, or it might be really wet and muddy. That's another really good indicator. Um, evidence of wetland plants, so like ferns um, or remnants of ferns at this point, but those kinds of things, old skunk cabbages, that usually indicates a wetland. So those types of things, again, a lot oftentimes sort of these very muddy areas. Or um, in certain areas, you might have trees sort of growing on these hummocks like this. So it's a moss covered area that's a little bit raised above the water and that's where the trees are actually growing. That's another really good indicator of a vernal area um, in this, that will be filling in the spring and over the winter. So what we're gonna look at doing is monitoring, finding the location of these, um, getting a rough estimate of the size of the pool and then monitoring on a regular basis, um, going out, you know, on a certain date, um, looking for air temperature information, water temperature information, whether there's ice and snow present, um, the water depth, if we can measure that, and then whatever species are using the pool. Um, and usually that's going to be through photos and, you know, some data sheets, um, fairly simple. I will say that this project has a lot of flexibility in the timing of activities. So it really kind of is up to you. You could go out now and start looking for promising areas if you were really interested in it, um, or you could wait until, you know, January, February, um, and start seeing if there's some of those areas that are full of water, um, kind of a thing. And even if you're only interested in one part of this, so say you really only want to help find and map the, the vernal pools, but you don't really want to monitor them on any kind of ongoing basis, that's fine. I would love to have your help monitoring them, you know, finding them and sort of getting a, an idea of size and shape. Um, but if you're only interested in mon monitoring an identified pool and don't want to go off trail and find them yourself, that's fine too, let me know. Um, there's lots of options. And this is a project that I'm trying to keep training to a minimum. I mean, basically what you just sat through is pretty much the training. Um, I will give you some references so that you have pictures of what the egg masses look like and the species and that kind of thing. But um, it's really flexible. 
from that perspective. I may have another sort of short Zoom or record something that I can say to you, hey, this is on the YouTube channel, go watch it and it'll just help put things in perspective. I am putting the finishing touches on that plan right now. So I don't know exactly what it's gonna look like. Um, any of you who have participated in the iNaturalist trainings before, I may actually just use iNaturalist as the app for collecting species data um, and just do it that way. So there's no data sheets to submit from that perspective and the rest of the stuff you could just send me in an email kind of a thing and then just put all your photos into iNaturalist so that they'll all be there um, to be able to be shared with other people as well. So. Again, sort of working out the final details of what that looks like, um, but this is a really important project for us to try to understand what's out there. And you can imagine from a staff perspective, there aren't very many of us that can go out and do this um, regularly. And so we really need some volunteers to be out there and helping us hopefully find those spotted salamanders and those wood frogs. Um, because I kind of have to believe that they're somewhere in our watershed. Uh, there may not be a lot of them and they may not be in every vernal pool, but I really, really holding out hope that they're out there somewhere and we just have to go find them. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in helping, um, please email me. So I'm going to jump to the last slide here. Um, my email address is down there at the bottom. It's Christy at wasiakandtrails.org. And please email me if you're interested and we can talk about what parts you're interested in um, and you know go from there um, we will have some more formal volunteer you know fill out this application for a volunteer just so that you get into the system but right now i really just would like people to email me directly so that i can kind of figure out how many people that i have and we can kind of figure out what areas people are operating in so um, Again, that's pretty much what I have for tonight. I'll see if there's any other questions up here. Um, I don't see any questions now. So um, as I'm wrapping up here, please feel free to, to type any questions into that chat box. Um, you can see a couple of upcoming events here. Um, beginning of November, I'll be doing a, a program on backyard bird feeding um, and some citizen science projects that happen um, for the winter that you might be interested in if you are doing backyard bird feeding. And then, um, in December, the ever popular All About Owls. So um, please see our website for information uh, to sign up. And that is all I have for this evening. So I hope that you have gotten a better understanding of what vernal pools are uh, and the importance that they play in the environment and a little bit about the species that are using them. And I don't see any more questions. So um, with that, I think I'm going to wrap up and um, well, let's see one pop up. No, thank you. So thank you very much for um, coming tonight and enjoy. Have a nice rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. <laughs>